Welcome to Small Practice Support Information Session number 75. In this recording, Paul Wise and Mark Lowry of Smith and Williamson talk to Justin Purcell about the 10th annual survey of law firms carried out by their firm. Uh, I'd like to uh, welcome you all to this uh, small practice information session uh, 75. I'm joined today by uh, Paul Wise and uh, Mark Lowry from Smith and Williamson. And they're going, to be, they're going to be talking us through their annual survey of law firms in Ireland. If anyone has a question, uh, we'll take it on the chat and we hope, hope to open the floor after around 20 minutes or so. So over to you, Paul. You're very welcome. And Mark, thank, thanks for joining us today. Thank you very much, Justin. Thanks for the opportunity to speak to the uh, small uh, firms uh, part of the law society. I think it's a, it's an essential part. It's it's the sig most significant part of law firms in Ireland, as we know. Um, so this year, we, we've been carrying out this survey for 10 years. So we now have a reasonable backtrack in terms of data, which helps us when we're looking at changes or movements. The second thing is to say is that this is done independently by Amoric Research. So we don't get um, you know, identify the firms, we just get the analysis of the results and then try and interpret them as the case may be. We had 113 firms participate this year. As you can see, the breakdown there, 15 are top 20 firms, 62 mid-tier firms, that's firms with more than five qualified solicitors that are outside the top 20, and 36 small firms, most of those are, are sole practitioner firms. Um, and that's why we, we split the data between top 20 and the rest because effectively the top 20 firms are so large and take up such a significant part of the marketplace that it's important that we split the data and um, because they have different issues sometimes to smaller firms um, and i think just not, not to interrupt you mark or, or uh, paul but last year there was a question around is this applicable to small firms and i think we've done a lot of work to try and get more smaller firms participate in this survey Yes, and you know, um, hopefully, as we go through this, I'll throw out some data that we have for you know outside the top twenty firms. What what are the, the the key things? Because as I say, there are differences. So today we're going to cover off you know um, five main pillars. Effectively, what's the outlook look like? Firm performance, people pay reward, mergers and acquisitions, and you know the impact of COVID, obviously, on on what's going on and technology um uh, as such so if we just flick on there mark so the outlook um i'm pleased to say like the last 12 months has seen a significant improvement the um dark red line is uh where we were on improvement last year and it was zero percent so zero firms thought things had improved in 2020 um, and that has now gone up to 43 percent nearly half of firms feel the last 12 months they've seen some improvement which is good there's probably a three track um recovery and progress now among law firms um you have firms who are seeing improvement firms who have seen things stabilize and firms that have seen things continue to de deteriorate and that's about 25 percent the latter category um about a third would be um stabilizing and 40 percent starting to see things improve so just to give people a, a sense of where things are at when you split that down between, you know, Dublin and outside Dublin as well, because regional firms sometimes see a slightly different marketplace. Um, in the regions, it's almost equal one third, one third, one third when you look at that category. Uh, Dublin is seeing a, a better um, a sign of improvement at the moment, which is normally where things start and then they move out into the, into the regions as the case may be. For the next 12 months, um, again, you know, people are feeling optimistic. Um, and 63% see things improving in the next 12 months. So that's two and three firms. Um, and the rest primarily see things uh, stagnating um, or stabilizing, should I say. So, you know, um, even when we look at individual firms and how they feel about themselves, these type of numbers are pretty much mirrored um, and we don't see any significant change. In the regions, it's about 62% see things stabilizing over the last 12 months and about 50% going forward. Um, so, you know, um, there are different challenges for each of these segments, top 20, Dublin firms outside the top 20 and regional firms. And we'll talk about some of those issues. <clears throat> I think we can move on, Mark. So when you look at firm performance, um, you know, 39% saw revenues recovering and increasing in the last 12 months. 
um, and 37% of firms saw their profits increase um, in the last 12 months. Um, now, you know, we had a fairly dramatic downturn in 2020 when a lot of firms saw their profits and turnover drop. Some firms saw that up to 40% of a hit. So it was, it was a massive hit in 2020. With the court system trying to work out how they were going to do remote working and remote hearings and all of that. And really 2020 saw a massive reduction in litigation. And 2021 starts to see a recovery in that because remote hearing started to take place. Um, you also had a fairly significant lockdown period in 2020, whereas we had some periods where we were open in 2021. All of that um, uh, gives rise to these type of, of, of numbers. But there are, as I say, a number of firms that are uh, in, uh, encountering revenue and profit challenges still um, in the marketplace. Um, and that could be, you know, the sectors they're dealing with, could be retail, hospitality. Um, it could be uh, the type of work that they do. Um, you know, uh, it, it could be particular areas like, I mean, the banks and revenue are not really enforcing debt during this period. So you have a, a significant reduction um, in, in, in that type of work as well. But I think the key message is, look, we haven't yet recovered to pre-pandemic levels at any stage where two and three firms are still showing profits and turnover less than what they were in 2019. We saw a better improvement last year in whip and debtors as people got used to the, to the lockdown. Okay, Mark. So what are the issues that we're seeing? Um, the top 20 firms, it's all about recruitment and retention. Um, and for Dublin firms outside the top 20, that is a key issue. It's not an issue in the regions. The key issue for smaller firms is how they maintain their profitability going forward. Um, there seems to be continuing pressure on fees. Um, you have bigger firms trying to offer more services to their client base. Um, and some firms are finding that their clients are being attacked by those firms as a result. Uh, the economy is less of a concern. I mean, the Irish economy has performed remarkably well during this whole crisis. Um, and the one issue we see that's increasing on, on smaller firms' radar is cyber risk. And um, that's between, you know, the fact that we have remote working and the fact that law firms are being targeted much more um, by cyber criminals. So that's an area where we are seeing a significant change. Okay, Mark. So what type of things have law firms been doing to um, uh, help their performance? And I suppose, like, you know, technology is, is, is one aspect of it. Uh, by investing in technology to improve their efficiency in, in the various processes of how they work. Um, a lot of law firms have had to have access to government supports. Last year was about 70% of those surveyed uh, accessed government supports. This year is about one in two. Um, and we'll have a look at the type of supports that different firms are using. Um, last year, in fairness, a number of law firms cut their operating costs. Now, some of that was obvious in terms of travel um, and um, advertising and things like that, that would naturally fall in a, in a situation like we found ourselves in. But a lot of firms took actions to reduce their operating costs. They saw their revenues decline and they took action. And that's the lesson that we learned out of the previous recession, the property recession of 2008 to 2013. Um, and then we also have firms obviously engaging professional advisors to help them um, and spending money on increasing their sales and uh, marketing activities um, digitally in particular. And a lot of money has gone into, you know, enhancing their digital brands um, so that they have a footprint outside of the physical meetings that are necessary and have been the traditional route to marketplace. Okay, Mark. Um, we were slightly surprised in some of the areas here, and I'm just going to talk about them. So obviously, remote working is, is a key issue for law practices going forward. What does it mean for small firms? What does it mean, you know, uh, in Dublin? What does it mean outside of Dublin? Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, staff numbers are increasing again, which is good. We saw a reduction last year for the first time in a while. We'll talk about pay and reward, um, the workplace and how that's going to function and staff well-being. Um, I suppose, you know, um, on an overall context, COVID-19 has created a massive challenge, an absolutely massive challenge for businesses globally, including law firms. 
it caused major disruption to working lives in the short term. And it's likely to change the way we work in the future. Um, we thought we had found the key through mass vaccination, but we found that fourth wave just clearly cut through vaccination. The good thing was it didn't result in significant hospitalizations um, and ICU in particular, but it has been very disruptive and difficult. And, you know, we've had to look at what happens if we have another wave, et cetera. I suppose before the pandemic, most worried about remote working and its impact on productivity and firm culture. When COVID arrived, you know, literally employees were sent home armed with laptops um, and have had to abruptly learn how to work from home and adapt their lifestyle um, and work remotely from their colleagues uh, for many months. And most professional service firms had not previously facilitated home working on such a grand scale. And we know that. Um, most firms have successfully adjusted now um, and have put systems in place to accommodate that reality. Um, and when the full lockdown was relaxed, firms had to learn how to manage their teams, some of whom now are working from home, some of whom are working in the office some of the time. So we, we, we were really in a learning phase now as to how we're going to adapt going forward and how we're going to deal with that. And you know, all of these things required our staff to make significant adjustments to their anticipated working arrangements. There was an NUIG survey in October 2020, which identified three key challenges of remote working, loneliness and isolation, staying motivated, and the physical workspace that people work in. Um, and you know, on the flip side, what were the advantages? Well, no traffic and commute in cities, greater flexibility as to how to manage the working day, and the reduced costs of working and commuting. So the return to the workplace is going to create a new opportunity um, for more effective operating models um, that enable people and businesses to navigate this world of increasing uncertainty. But we do have an increasing disconnect between what employees want and what employers want. And what this table shows is really, you know, what the employer perspective is. Most top 20 firms and most firms in Dublin will offer you know, a remote working environment where they will accommodate that. Regional firms, about one in three, have said they're unlikely to facilitate remote working. Um, and in you know, the, the smaller firms in Dublin, it's about one in five. But that's a flip side of what employees want. Employees are looking for greater flexibility. They've now got used to being able to work when they want and how they need to in an environment that and they enables them to have a different style of living than they've had in the past. So we do have significant challenges coming forward. Um, we were involved with the um, Law Society's um, Younger Members Committee in the survey they did on remote working, and there were about 1,200 people that uh, responded to that. And work-life balance and flexible working were the two key points that came out of that survey. Um, so I think as employers, everybody is going to have to face the challenge and come up with something that works um, and works for the type of practice that they have. Okay, thanks, Mark. <clears throat> so as I say, you know, we, we've started to see an increase in the numbers of staff in firms, about one in three increased staff numbers last year and about 42% um, stabilized in terms of the numbers, whereas previously, as, as you can see, that the, the, um, there was a significant decrease. Okay, Mark. So on the issue of pay, um, this is the one that surprised us most because the scale of the increases, as you can see in the slide, um, were quite significant where people had increased pay. Now, we think some of this was related to the fact that some people made decreases in the previous year and then just accounted for this as an increase, um, you know, because most uh, decreases in pay were in the order of between 10 and 20%, um, and therefore we're seeing a higher, but there was significant pay increases. There is a significant war for talent going on, especially in, the, in Dublin, um, and it is getting harder to get people. I mean, we are facing into what uh, McKinsey's called the great resign, where people have been able to work from home had a look at their lifestyle and decided, you know what, I'm not happy doing what I'm doing anymore. And have decided to either change job, go into an in-house type of situation for law firms, uh, which was already happening, 
or you know, look to the region or the location where they're working and see if there's something that's more accommodating to the lifestyle that they want. Um, so that's that's something that we're seeing. But there have been uh, significant uh, pay increases in about 40% of the um, top 20 firms. And um, you know, uh, I think that, that the bottom line here is, is that pay, uh, as we can see with the current inflationary trends, is going to be a key issue for firms this year. And if that inflation is transitory and is as expected and comes down by mid-year, it won't be as big a problem. If that remains in place and inflation becomes a problem, then it's going to become an issue because how do you, you know, get these fee increases when there are fee pressures out there? So um, again, just to say, obviously, there is um, a significant movement um, around pay in the current year. So that's going to be a tricky issue. Okay, thanks, Mark. Um, M&A for small firms is becoming a bigger issue. Um, uh, I suppose it really, I would call it succession. It's not, it's not really M&A, it's succession planning. Um, and we have seen a significant increase in thinking and planning about succession in recent months by um, partners in smaller firms, more so than heretofore. Um, I, I refer to it as the silver tsunami of baby boomers. Uh, that's those were born between 1946 and 1964 who were told apparently live to work and are in leadership positions in many firms. They are now considering their retirement, um, which is leading to many succession problems for many firms. The next generation, which is called Gen X, that's those born between 1965 and 1980, have a slightly different phrase, which is they work to live. Um, so therefore, you know, equity partnerships are not seen as the golden apple for them. Uh, Work-life balance is much more important. Um, and therefore, a lot of succession planning, you know, where people had identified potential equity partners are floundering. Um, so what's, what are the things that people need to, to, to bear in mind here? I suppose one of the things that's helping is the... Um, introduction of the LLP status. Um, and we saw a significant increase in the number of partnerships that have now become LLPs this year, like 60% of the top 20 firms uh, that responded were LLPs. And the other 40% said they were becoming LLPs, as in they are already on track. That is also happening down the line. So sole practitioners are you know, one of the things we would say is you need to look and see, are there suitable peoples to bring into a partnership? Because if you can have an LLP, you can address the issue of liability, which is one of the biggest concerns people have around the area of merging, especially with sole practitioners or general partnerships. It's one of the biggest blocks that has uh, been in the profession for years. So if you can um, use that as an option, that's a, that's a good starting place. And the second one is, is to identify firms that are looking to expand, um, you know, that are looking for the type of clients that you have um, and to engage in discussions early um, and just get it down to those that are really interested as distinct from those that just want to have a cup of coffee with you. So preparation and preparing well in advance is key. Sorting out the problems in the practice. Um, you know, uh, you know, you need to put your best foot forward in these situations. Um, so, you know, looking at um, have you got the right team in place? Um, have you got the your your issues, whatever problems or issues there are on files resolved so that they're not carrying problems over? And have you got your whip and debtor sorted out? You know, have you got your billings reasonably up to date? Have you got your letters of engagement, etc.? All of those things are pretty critical. So. Whilst to date there hasn't been a significant amount of mergers and acquisitions, it is going to grow substantially. And in the last six months, you know, we have seen ourselves a lot more solicitor firms talking to us um, about M&A. And, you know, um, I, I can talk about the fact that, you know, we just finished the Eames um, uh, merger with Clark Hill because we, that's been published and publicized uh, in the last few days. So, you know, that's a sole practitioner firm that's been able to merge with a larger firm um, with a boutique expertise that they were looking to add into their, their, their skill sets. Okay, I think that's it, Mark, on, on M&A. So, 
So technology, um, I suppose, you know, uh, as I said, these are the, the main areas we see where people are investing. Um, and um, the light green is top 20 and, you know, all firms is in the darker green. So, you know, there's a lot of firms because more than each of these represents more than one in two of the respondents are investing in each of these areas. So cybersecurity, as I've said, is a significant area and has become a bigger problem for smaller firms or become much more on their radar. Um, and the uh, Gazette did a good article, I think it was in February of 2021, around that, and it's worth reading it and just reminding yourself of what the type of things you can do. Um, because especially practices that hold client monies are much more under threat. Um, managing workflows and document management um, are key areas, and um, a lot of firms are investing in those two areas. Enhancing client experience, and because of the fact that we've lived remotely now for nearly two years, people are looking at remote access for their clients um, and improving what they can do remotely with their clients as well. The digital brand, as I said, obviously making sure that people have a presence in the marketplace um, digitally. And then remote working, where last year we saw a significant investment and this year it's back down because, you know, I think in fairness, most law firms have coped well with remote working. Okay. Um, so as I said, like, you know, we've, we've seen a real spike this year in, in concern about cyber. Um, and, um, you know, there, there has been a, a significant increase in cyber attacks uh, that's been well reported in the media. Um, and I suppose, um, you know, one just has to be very careful um, around opening attachments and opening emails um, and staff training around this area is a critical factor. I mean, um, I don't know how many suspicious emails we get as an organization each day, but we have an automatic um, icon on our system where we can just report something and it can be checked by our IT guys and it comes back and you're told whether it's to be deleted or it's, it's already deleted or you can actually access it. And that is a big aspect. I mean, um, uh, I think most of us are seeing a significant number of that. And I think a lot of firms don't even report it. You know, I mean, certainly in our survey, we would expect most firms to be getting dodgy emails at least a couple of times a year. And, you know, still we're only getting one in three firms, you know, outside the top 20 reporting cyber attacks. Um, I think it's much bigger than that. Okay, Mark. So you can't have a discussion, I'm afraid, at the moment without talking about COVID. So we're just going to briefly talk about the long-term impact, the uh, workplace measures taken by firms, the performance of firms and government supports. I suppose, you know, this is one pandemic that has impacted almost every single aspect of our lives and our working lives. Um, and our government and all the rest. So it impacted everything. It, it impacted the economy. It impacted our clients. It impacted our workplace. It impacted family and friends. Um, so, you know, uh, th this is a much, uh, a hopefully once in a lifetime event that we have to face into. Um, I think I was reading uh, an article there yesterday from John Fitzpatrick, the hotel in New York, and he thought like, you know, 9-11 would be the once in a lifetime event they would have to deal with. And suddenly he's dealing with the pandemic. So, you know, things happen much quicker nowadays. So what have people been doing? Um, the gold bars are the smaller firms. Um, and, you know, um, a lot of firms uh, reduced partner drawings uh, during the initial 12 month period in particular, and some have continued that. Um, and they also reduced the discretionary overheads, marketing, business development, et cetera. Um, and then, you know, we had to deal with staff holidays as an issue and make sure staff were taking holidays and not building up massive um, holiday banks to carry forward. Um, and then deferring pay reviews were, were the type of things that firms did. Um, Thankfully, we're starting to see like all the, the wage cuts that we saw in 2020, most of them have been reinstated now by most firms. Okay. Um, this just shows you like that the first two, two um, bars, as the case may be, relate to negative impact of COVID. So as you can see, like, you know, um, it is still 
two and three firms that have had a negative impact on their turnover um, as a result. And about 20% of firms have seen turnover drop by 20% over the period. We have seen firms with substantially more. Again, it's very dependent on the type of work that they're doing. Um, and few firms have succeeded. And the same on profitability, it's exactly the same. So what type of government supports have people been accessing? Um, I suppose uh, the bottom line is, is that um, there's been less access to government supports in 2021 than 2020. Um, but the pandemic unemployment payment was the one that was used by regional firms more so than city firms. Um, a lot of firms used the deferral of tax as well. And the wage subsidies, you know, almost half of firms used um, the temporary payment, uh, temporary wage subsidy schemes. So to finish, um, I suppose, you know, uh, we got to look at how this uh, pandemic impacts how we work. And that is the most significant aspect we're going to have to deal with this year and going forward and building a strategy to work effectively and efficiently. Um, so, you know, I think um, with pay and inflation, with remote working, and with trying to get firm performance back on track, um, they're the key issues I would see in the new normal. That's it, Justin. Very <coughs> through. Hopefully that is of some benefit. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, we've just got a, a couple more minutes to run, so we'll open it up to questions and answers if anybody has one. But two things that kind of jumped out to me was just one optimism that the thing people are, are more optimistic going forward, and that's lead, led to more increased thoughts around succession and mergers, merger activity. So it would be good to just understand a little bit better. If I'm a sole practitioner and I hadn't really thought about that at all, what, what are the types of things do I need to start doing and what type of uh, help or what type of people do I need to sort of attract to help me uh, see whether merging with another operation is a good idea or planning my succession? Yeah, I suppose two things I'm going to say. One is there is a much more defined marketplace in accountancy firms than in law firms. So in accountancy firms, there are metrics and matrices that are used in M&A activity that are not used in law firms. OK, so goodwill would feature in a lot of accountancy practices and it features much less so in law firms. More of the law firm type mergers are evolved around how you realize your whip and your debtors and you reduce the liability to your staff on redundancy and long-term service and things like that. So you have to look at the WIP, the debtors, the long-term employment, you know, and what is the, the growth pattern or, you know, whatever of the practice. So you, you need to, you know, when you're looking to find a suitor, um, if it's internal, have discussions early. I mean, all of this is about preparation, not waiting until you're 65 or 70 years of age to start thinking about it. You need to think about it five years in advance of what you propose, your proposed date of retirement is, because in any merger of a small practitioner's firm, you are going to have the key relationships with the clients, and you're going to be required to stay for a period of time to hand over those relationships properly, effectively, and so that they, they, they continue. The other thing is to have a look at you know, firms that you think might be suitable. And to have cups of coffee early and chats with people, um, you know, um, I mean, a lot of firms that um, we talk to, it's, it's, it's in their region, you know, let's call it that, where the most potential is for them to do a merger. And um, we have, like, I mean, we're aware of a number of firms that are in the mid tier outside the top 20 that are looking to add service offerings as well. So we're always looking out for boutique type practices or a practice that has a very good commercial, say, uh, range of clients that is uh, attractive to those who are out there who are looking to expand. And, you know, there are always firms looking to expand. It's just knowing who they are, knowing what type of things they're looking for and fitting, you know, fitting into that scenario. Very good. We're just running into the to the last minute of our time. Uh, if anyone would like to ask us a question, uh, we'll take it now. I'll just uh, quickly... Uh, share my screen there just to talk about next week's session, which is digital marketing and planning. Um, and I'm joined by Ty Geary from Evolve Marketing who's gonna to talk to us about marketing planning and how your law firm can compete uh, online without a huge budget. So Paul and Mark, thanks a million for joining us today. Unless anybody has a, has a final question, 
Paul, do you have any final words for us before before we leave today? No, I just think it's it's a positive environment. The country's doing well. I think you know uh, economic activity will be good this year, um, and it's just make sure you know that that your your firm is well prepared for it. And staffing and remote working are two issues you need to just get on top of quickly, and communicate clearly with your staff about. Listen, guys, thanks for joining us today. Slán is thanks to everyone for joining us. Hopefully, we'll speak to you next week.